So now it is my pleasure to introduce you to Alfredo Bellido. He comes actually from Barcelona, from the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, where he is currently there an associate professor. Uh, he's done like his PhD in John Muir's University in Liverpool, working in medical applications of neural networks, and then in the area of business application of neural networks as well. Uh, and then he was involved in computational neurosciences. He's currently a um, member of the IEEE data mining committee and where he's chairing the task force on medical data analysis. And he's a member of the editorial board of different journals like PLOS One and Neural Processing Letters. So please, Alfredo. Hey. Okay, does it work? Yeah, it does. Well, first of all, uh, Thanks, Sergio and, and Emilia, for this kind invitation. I'm honored to, to give a talk here um, and discuss a few things with you. Uh, I belong to the EDI Research Center, EDI for Intelligent Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. Uh, that belongs to the UPC. I want to stress this EDI thing, first for publicity, second for, uh, I think it's a bit of a sign of the times. Uh, this is a brand new center, barely one year old, and uh, it's actually a virtual center of artificial intelligence. It's 60, around 60 uh, senior researchers, uh, plus a cloud of PhD students, master students, all people who do some sort of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, in whichever application. It includes people from soft computing, machine learning, uh, natural language processing, signal and image processing, etc. Okay, uh, this center somehow was born out of a need, which is uh, suddenly uh, lots, and I mean lots of people from companies, from other uh, research centers, from whichever uh, way of life, they are knocking at the doors of the university saying, who is doing artificial intelligence here? We have this data, we have this problem, we have this interest, who is doing artificial intelligence here? And there was no door, no single door to knock at. Okay, uh, maybe ten years ago this was not a problem. It was, I mean, someone knocked the door every now and then. Uh, Who is doing artificial intelligence? Well, I don't know this or that. Now we needed a kind of unified center, even if virtual, in order to, you know, concentrate this influx of demand. But what I insist is that this demand is new, and is part of all the hype around going around on artificial intelligence. Well, first of all, also, I have changed the title, sorry. I have changed the title of my talk. I mean, it's not the one that appears exactly in your, <coughs> tend to do this type of things. I, it's just, I mean, 30 minutes, I, I probably, I, I couldn't cover everything. So I wanted to focus on interpretability, explainability, and the societal impact of artificial intelligence in the area of medicine and healthcare. And you know, um, I wanted to start with some encouragement, uh, some cheerful message such as this. Uh, you know, there is something that bothers me. I mean, it's not just the hype. I mean, people have already <coughs> talked about the hype. I mean, artificial intelligence is all over the place in the news, and not just in the academic news or technical news. I mean, it's, you, know, you open the newspaper or the magazine, it's artificial intelligence all the way, you know, for any sort of thing. And um, in the area, in particular, in the area of medicine and healthcare, there is something that really bothers me. It's like uh, I've been doing uh, machine learning, mostly, applications uh, uh, in medicine and healthcare for 20 plus years. Okay? So, I mean, I've, I've, I've been through a few waves of hype. You know, in the 1990s, it was all a different type of, of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, that was promised to be, you know, the holy grail for medicine and healthcare, etc. But not much happened, and actually the interest kind of just uh, disappeared for a long while. And suddenly we are in now again in this kind of big wave uh, of interest about it, and everybody's saying that, you know, it's the next uh, silver bullet or whatever. But what bothers me here is that um, if this is true, and I mean, uh, who was one of the previous presenters uh, actually made, made me a favor. Uh, uh, she presented a paper, it was, I think, from 1995, 
with an application of artificial neural networks on medicine, etc. I mean, it could have been published today. I mean, the title, everything, but it's, it's over 20 years old. So if that's the case, why are not we seeing all these things in practice applied in hospitals, in the medical sector, by clinicians in their everyday practice? It is not. I mean, maybe here and there, but it's not. I mean, it's not part of the day-to-day -day routine of, as far as I can tell. I'm not a physician, no? uh, I'm not a medical expert, but I don't see them using it. I, I, it was there 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, when expert systems were before you know, machine learning. It was there. So why people are not applying it? And that's what really concerns me. I think there are quite a few reasons for that. Some of them very nicely put by Bart in his previous talk. I think there is more. And we are, I reckon, at a very critical time uh, as, as concerns the application of artificial intelligence in medicine. Mm? And a few things that should at least a bit curb our enthusiasm. A bit of context. I mean, let me take a couple of steps back. And this is something we take for, I mean, we have been talking about data, data, more data, less data, whatever. But you know, in the um, life sciences in general, and medicine and healthcare, you know, let's say, as an aside of uh, the life sciences and biology, uh, everything is becoming very quickly, very swiftly data centered. Okay? And in biology, in general, I mean, this is, you know, something that from the omics revolution suddenly has become a kind of commonplace. And somehow from the omics and bioinformatics, etc., that's permeating, you know, the rest of the life sciences realm and medicine as well and healthcare as well. To such an extent that now they are even doing philosophical studies about, you know, how data centrism is changing biology as a science and could, could change medicine as a science. Okay, yeah, I mean, we know the data, we know that everybody talks about big data. I'm surprised that big data, the name big data has not come up already 20 times this morning, all right? But you know, I mean, people are fearing this tsunami of data and what do we do about it? In some cases, for good reasons. I mean, this figure at the right-hand side, it's from the European Bioinformatics Institute. I mean, it's not up to date, it's up to 2015, but it tells a lot. You know, back in 2009, not that long ago, a decade ago, they were storing five petabytes of data. In 2015, they were storing 75 petabytes of data. Probably they have now gone all the way over the limit of 100 petabytes. I mean, that's a, an humongous amount of data. I mean, it's so big that, you know, literally they are, bil they are building, you know, a warehouse, you know, to store, you know, the hardware necessary to, you know, just handle those data. And I'm talking just storing and handling those data. I mean, these people have to share the data. A single genome, it's quite a few gigabytes, you know? A single one, from a single person, say. And these people are having real trouble just, you know, how do we share it? If we receive millions of requests for data, how do we share it as science? I'm not talking even how do we make sense of those data? How do we analyze those data and extract new knowledge out of those data? Okay, this is the bioinformatics. I mean, this is not necessarily, of course, the case of medicine in general, healthcare, but you know, th th this problem is here. And right now, and this is kind of the marriage made in heaven, you know, we have this rebirth of connectionism, uh, for those of you in artificial intelligence, connectionism in the form of deep learning. Suddenly everything is deep learning, you know? It's like, Jesus Christ, I mean, there was other things before and there are still quite a few things beyond deep learning. I mean, deep learning is nice. It does very good things with analyzing certain type of data in a certain setting. But you know, we have been around all this before, as I said, with shallow artificial neural networks, then super vector machines, then whatever, and random forests, and now deep learning everywhere, you know? Or students only want to learn about deep learning. That's the situation, I mean, that's, that's, that. Okay, not too bad, I mean, things, these things happen, but mm, let me go back to medicine, right? This is uh, a workshop organized by NIPS a year and a half ago, eh? NIPS 2017. NIPS is the Rolls Royce of Artificial Intelligence Conference, or one of them, okay? So, I mean, if you are there, mm, nice. 
this was, I mean, I want, you, I want to draw your attention to a title. Huh? What parts of healthcare are ripe for disruption by machine learning right now? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I read in the same sentence, healthcare and disruption gives me a bit of the creeps, you know? I'm, I understand healthcare as, you know, universal, hopefully health, ser uh, sorry, uh, social service, something paid by the taxpayers, etc. So disruption mm, by machine learning, what do we mean here? I mean, I'm, uh, it's okay, it's the title is a punchy title for a workshop, nothing wrong about it, but what surprised me was who was, you know, organizing it, okay? Mustafa Suleiman from Google DeepMind and Jennifer Chayes from Microsoft Research New England. Mm? This is just an example. Mm? These people, I mean, these companies are behind a terrific push to enter the medical and healthcare realm. I mean, they are putting lots of bucks in there, you know? They are, they are, expending, they are spending real money uh, to get into the medical sector, heavily, okay? And this is one of the points that really makes it critical right now. I mean, because these companies have the technology, they have the data, and they are investing heavily in artificial intelligence to such an extent that artificial intelligence right now is mostly driven by the companies. Most of the senior, very senior top researchers in the area are hired by Google, Amazon, Facebook, or Baidu, or whoever. Okay? Not that they don't do their academic work, etc. cetera. No, I'm not, not meaning that this is awful, the dark side of life, but it's, it's a reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, so because of this industrialization mm, of artificial intelligence, because of the fact that some of these companies are really leading the way, okay? Now we are witnessing, and you don't need any examples, how artificial intelligence in many forms is entering society. The Internet of Things, your mobile phones, you name it. Eh? Maps, Google, eh? yeah, the examples uh, are very commonplace. Okay, but the point is that because artificial intelligence is in society, it's having an impact, a clear impact on society. An example, uh, this was a piece of news in The Guardian, in the UK, like uh, it was September 2018, it's recent news. Councils used 377,000 people's data in efforts to predict child abuse. Okay, well, it's like a nice application of data analysis, of data science, <coughs> trying to predict child abuse. I mean, at first, I mean, the surface sounds all right, but then again, all those data were, using, were used without the consent of anyone involved. What if you are predicted to be a child abuser? And someone knocks your door and says, well, you know, our machine said, <laughs> red flag, you might be, with 95% accuracy, a child abuser. What are the social consequences of that? Okay, these are council people. I mean, it's administration, local administration. And they were happily using, you know, data from a population, I don't know, 377,000 is Badalona or L'Hospitalet, you know, I don't know, Tarrasa. Big numbers, okay? So, social impact is there, mm, waiting for us to catch us unaware. And there are quite a few areas in which this is key. Legislation, explainability and interpretability, privacy and anonymity, ethics and fairness, and the overlap of all of them. I'm sure you might even come up with more. Okay, and all of them have true impact in medicine and healthcare. The point is, if we really care about the societal impact of artificial intelligence in medicine and healthcare, first of all, we need, uh, and this has been already said, we need to design systems that are human-centered. We have to design our systems from a human-centered perspective, uh, according to societal requirements, and this is not trivial at all. In terms of ethics and fairness, there is an obvious bottleneck. Is that, you know, people who, well, the people who started doing research, uh, who created artificial intelligence as, let's say, science, well, probably they, they didn't think much about ethics. Uh? Well, they were computer scientists. So. Um, but anyway, 
they don't have much of a social life. Um, there are quite a few computer scientists. Sorry, sorry. I'm not a computer scientist, so. But anyway, okay, ethics is, um, in fact, is intelligence in society. When intelligences interact, you need to create certain rules. And those rules somehow congeal in the form of ethics or morals or whatever you want to call it. Mm? And this, funny enough, has only become central to the artificial intelligence discussion in recent years. Now everybody's talking about ethics and machine, uh, and machine learning or artificial intelligence, but only in the last few years. Okay? Funny enough, you know, ethics, sorry, ethics is something that has concerned medicine forever. I mean, there are ethical rules, ethical guidelines uh, that are applied in hospitals, etc. So you could say that it's the best place, you know, to talk about ethics. But the point is that right now, as we speak, there is no clear roadmap for the use of ethics in artificial intelligence in its application to medicine and healthcare. And I don't mean that they are not making it as we speak, right? I mean, people are beginning to get really... But there is no clear roadmap according to which we should implement in reality uh, ethics in artificial intelligence in this context. And fairness. Fairness has also come up, you know? Can we make or, algo or artificial intelligence algorithms fair? Well, I think the question is misplaced, you see? I mean, and this has already been said as well. Fairness is not in the machine. Fairness is in the human uh, that is using it. Fairness is, if you want, even embedded in the data generated by humans. Because most of the data and medical data, healthcare data, are created by humans. And if there is a bias in the data, the machine doesn't care. The bias is there. The machine is going to learn to be as biased as the human who has created the data. Full stop. And again, right now, there is a whole school of research in machine learning trying to design algorithms that can somehow, in different ways, compensate for that bias of unfairness. Unfairness can be uh, about et ethnic origin, about income, about gender. But if the data, you know, are already contaminated by that, it's very difficult to get rid of it. This is a trivial example I, I'm sure many of you have already, have already seen. You know? Can you spot the gorilla in the room here? Hmm? This is uh, Google's automatic image tagging uh, uh, system based on artificial intelligence. Right? Uh, skyscraper, identify a skyscraper. Whoa, good. Airplane, th that airplane is difficult. I actually, it took me some time to realize it was an airplane. Cars, bikes, gorillas. <laughs> Oops. What happened there? Well, I mean, the machine thought that was that nice selfie was a couple of gorillas. That's bad. Mm? And someone found out because it was their friends, his friends or something, <laughs> didn't take it lightly. Okay, fair enough. So what if the machine has learned that? Well, I mean, this might be anecdotal, what is not anecdotal is the solution, you know? It took three years to Google to come up with the solution which was basically remove the gorillas from the training algorithm, you know? Three years, Google, you know? I mean, if it takes three years to Google to think of the only way to remove bias, hmm, in this case, that have to, might have to do with ethnic origin or whatever, the color of your skin, was to remove the data, well, we are in trouble. I mean, that means that's an extremely difficult thing to remove. So unfairness might be there. Mm? And it could be institutionally and contextually grounded. And there is a point that has also been raised. The thing is that uh, in hospitals and uh, in the clinical domain, you don't always have access to all the details of the data for privacy and anonymity reasons. I mean, you might be... Uh, unknowingly unfair because you don't have the information, actually. You really don't control it. So if unfairness is there, it might completely skip your attention as a medical expert. Not an easy uh, setting at all, all right? Privacy and anonymity, that was another of the societal impacts, you know? Very clear in the medical domain. I mean, you need anonymity and privacy and you cannot you know, share happily uh, 
your data, I mean, patients' data, or whatever, mm, to you know, private companies. Well, that's a problem, you see, because I mean, especially in certain health systems, the interaction between the public and the private can be really dodgy. You know, there was a piece of news only a few weeks ago about corruption of uh, uh, a company which, which was delivering machinery to uh, the nephrology sector here in Catalonia, amongst other places. Uh, you know, those pe I mean, sometimes private companies, imagine insurance companies, they really would like to have your data, hmm? your health data, in order to provide insurance in a way that profits them. So, I mean, that's, that's an obvious concern. And again, there has been hmm, reportedly l very little activity in policy development uh, involving the numerous significant privacy issues that this might entail. And I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. Mm? And <coughs> sorry, this is especially important in the context of electronic health records. Because, for instance, machine learning, artificial intelligence, one of the targets right now, a hot topic of research, is the automatic analysis of electronic health records. So privacy in electronic health records is complicated. And some machine learning methods are being developed to actually break that uh, privacy and anonymity as a way of making the machine learning methods better. So, this is a problem when you have, as uh, it has also been said before, you know, something like the Microsoft's, uh, Microsoft's Hanover Project or IBM's Watson Technology or Google's DeepMind dealing with medical data. Mm? This is for just a screenshot from the Hanover Project by uh, Microsoft. Uh, an example, uh, it was last year, so it's a very recent example. Uh, three London hospitals uh, shared the data of their patients with Google DeepMind. And uh, they didn't care at all about anonymity, privacy, or whatever. They just handed the data, okay? And it was, uh, apparently it was a very silly thing. I mean, it was just to develop an app, nothing more than an app, for uh, people with uh, uh, kidney injury. Right? Assess their state, whatever. But what this ended up in nature, and this guy over here uh, is actually the uh, director, the executive director of the Royal Statistical Society of London. I mean, not anyone really. Uh, really, really serious guy. I mean, uh, because basically the UK regulator had uh, ruled against these three hospitals for dealing with their data in that way. I mean, we are not talking about, I mean, we are talking about London hospitals. I mean, they are supposed to know they were around this thing. Huh? The important thing here, I mean, I, I recommend this paper if you haven't had a look at it. This is a commentary paper. I mean, he makes a few recommendations about the, you know, trying to increase society's trust on data, uh, how the transference of data should be proportional to the task, but importantly, lack of governance and legislation associated to mechanisms of control. And this is key because this takes us to legislation, which is another issue. Mm? Legislation must also be involved in medicine and healthcare practice. I mean, people in medical practice know that. Mm? And we need to ensure that any artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, technology comply with current legislation. And current legislation is becoming complicated mm? for different reasons. Not just, of course, in medicine. I mean, you could think about automatic driving, you could think about defense systems. Uh, who is responsible, who is in charge, uh, you know, if uh, an automatic car runs over someone or if an automatic weapon kills civilians. I mean, all of that has to go against current legislation, which is not always prepared. Funny enough, defense legislation uh, in the times of war and things like that is more advanced in this sense, and they have made a better job than other legislations. But in here, I'm sure that for medical doctors, this will ring a bell. I mean, the point now is the GDPR, okay? Came into place last year, and in its Article 13, it gives citizens the right to explanation of any automated or artificial intelligence algorithmic systems, literally, okay? It's legally bound. Huh? A data controller is legally bound 
to give city, uh, requesting citizens with meaningful information about the logic involved as well as the significance of and the envisaged consequences of such processing, blah, blah, blah. Black, uh, black and white, okay? Who is the data controller in the case of medicine and healthcare? It's the doctor, the medical doctor, or the nurses in charge, or the hospital, or the, I don't know, the Ministry of uh, Health, right? Not trivial, who is the data controller and what sort of explanation are you bound to give? And this takes us to the topic of interpretability and explainability. I mean, legislation is actually bounding the medical sector to provide explanation when required. Mm? Of course, in a hospital, if you are providing any diagnosis, prognosis, recommendation of treatment or whatever, and you have your machine there and it says, Ooh, you have a glioblastoma, your patient has a glioblastoma, right? Brain tumor. And the doctor says to the patient, well, I'm sorry, you have a glioblastoma, so your uh, prognosis is this and that, okay? If the machine is wrong, who is in charge? Is the doctor who said, because I mean, you, I'm sure all of you have experienced similar situations in other sectors. You go to a bank and you ask for a mortgage or you ask for a credit and someone says, well, the machine says you are not entitled to have why? <laughs> the machine says so. Are you silly or what? I mean, the machine says you are not risk worthy. Well, right now, in theory, you have the right to request an explanation why the machine said I'm not credit worthy. Okay? Translate that into the clinical sector. I mean, how, how do you explain someone when you get things wrong? I mean, you need to explain it. Uh, that's where explainability uh, and interpretably come to the fore. Mm? So, all interpretable models can be explained. I mean, you cannot explain something, you cannot interpret it. And again, we come to the black box thingy of machine learning, etc. Something fun is happening right now. I assure you, people in machine learning are, are making, are jumping over all hurdles, hurdles trying to make their models interpretable. And I'm talking now mostly about deep learning. Deep learning is like the blackest of black boxes, okay? How difficult it is? Much more difficult. I mean, you have three layers before of obscurity, now you have 300 layers of obscurity, okay? So how do we interpret that? And people are doing something funny, which is trying to explain deep learning using simple models, like trees, decision trees, or linear uh, local models, and stuff like that. And some people are arguing, well, I mean, why did we go all the way to over complex nonlinear deep learning if in the end we have to explain it using a bloody decision tree. Why didn't we use the random forest in the first place and things like that? Okay, so th this is part of a, of, of a current discussion which is not obvious at all, right? <coughs> in fact, we also, w the same NIPs I have some before, we also went there and, and, and uh, with a workshop on, you know, tr transparent and interpretable machine learning. Uh, safety critical environments. One of them was precisely the medical and clinical sector and especially the intensive care units, critical care. Uh, in, was by its own definition, safety critical. Mm? So the problem boils to something that already Bart has covered you know, quite explicitly, mm? which is the huge gap we don't always acknowledge. And I'm talking we as data scientists, we don't always acknowledge between the data and the decision making. And we consistently underestimate this gap. From data to possible patterns in the data, from those patterns in the data to, to those patterns which are useful enough, enough to generate new knowledge, from that knowledge to some sort of human decision making. So in the end, it's always machine learns and humans in the end decide. Okay? And this is, I mean, for me, this is uh, something that has taken me 20 years to really understand. You know, in the end, is the human. And, you know, you will see lots of papers saying, well, we, I mean, this machine has overcome the best radiologists and whatever. Okay, yeah, but, uh, I mean, the truth, for me, at least in my experience, is something much more simple. It's doctors, experts, usually get it right. They don't want the machine to overrule them. I mean, they need extra help. And that extra help might be what Bart said, you know, in terms of handling, you know, if they have too many data, handling that first, 
you know, obnoxious you know, process of, of, of getting it right so that it can be properly analyzed. But also looking for the exception. Mm? What he said about the exception, that's, that's, for me, that's key, right? I mean, doctors want help about specific things that they don't understand fully. You know, that ex why on earth I thought this was a glioblastoma and the machine says it's a metastasis? Okay, things like that. That's what they are looking for, not 92% accuracy instead of 90% accuracy. And they, they don't give a bollock about that. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and this has been already said quite a few times. So what we really need, and that's again my opinion, is a proper framework to handle interpretability and explainability. I mean, something formal, because I mean, let's, I mean, come on. I mean, doctors love, or not, protocols and guidelines. I mean, they need them, or not. <laughs> Uh, but you need them. You need, you need those guidelines and protocols to, I mean, it's a safety net, all right? So we need something like a formal framework if we are going to integrate interpretability into our medical decision support systems, okay? So we have the analytics, the analysis system, but we have the analyst, the data scientist, which in the end is human, okay? And that's an intermediate layer between the machine learning itself and the medical experts through expert verification. And for me, the key is there, right? Because the human data analyst is going to make already an interpretation of the machine learning results or the artificial intelligence results. But that's not necessarily compatible with medical practice. So we need the expert verification. So we need an extra layer here. The interaction between the data analyst and the medical expert to increase interpretability uh, beyond you know, the previous data analysis. And the data analyst should be able to request certain things to the medical, to the medical expert <coughs> and, the, and the other way around. The medical expert should ask the data analyst to guarantee medical interpretability. Hmm? Medical, not interpretability in general, medical interpretability. Compliance with protocols and guidelines. If your interpretation doesn't comply with my guidelines, there's not much I can do about it. And point of care workflow compliance again. Point of care workflow, for instance, intensive care units is, is key. So you cannot make interpretations, well, you should not make interpretations that are not compatible with that workflow. In turn, the data analyst should request a few things from the medical expert. A statement of interpretability requirements. What do you mean by interpretable results? Mm? Common language. Understanding the limitations of interpretability. I mean, you cannot ask for everything because the machine is not going to be able to do everything or provide you with everything. A clear description of the medical decision-making process. If, as a data analyst, I'm, I don't have a clear information about how the doctor is going to make decisions, I'm in the dark, OK? Doesn't matter how good my systems are. And also a verification of the data analyst results. I mean, in the end, those results you have obtained, even from the point of view of interpretability, have to be validated and revised by the medical expert himself. And I will say even more. Uh, there should be even an extra layer, which is the interaction between the medical expert and the medical and clinical domain. I mean, in turn, that medical expert should be aware of his or her context uh, within the uh, decision-making system. So all in all, just to summarize, uh, governance and legislation, uh, explainability and interpretability, privacy and anonymity, fairness, and ethics, all those things might be actually part of the same problem. It's properly understanding uh, the <coughs> societal impact of the use of artificial intelligence in a domain so particular, so special as medicine and healthcare. And I don't know if I have time for more. Or ha I no, OK. I just give you, if, if I have a few minutes, uh, let me give you uh, just an example, a, a very specific one, silly, but anecdotal, if you want but something that made me learn a lot. I mean, this was 10 years ago. <clears throat> it was about neuro-oncology, brain tumor diagnosis. Mm? And this is something we published, well, a few papers amongst them, this one in neurocomputing, and a, a, a journal in our area. Outlayer uh, exploration and diagnostic classification of a multicenter proton MRS brain tumor database. Okay, we were analyzing what was supposed to be a fully curated 
database. Clean, nice, with labels. It was a very small database. So it was a case of a small data, not of big data, small data. A few hundred cases. This was the best around. Uh, it was international database, multi-center database, whatever. It was supposed to be mm, top-notch. Good. We started by exploring it, visualizing it just with some projects. I mean, it was highly dimensional. We visualized it in 3D, a bit interactively, trying to find whether there was something weird. And we actually found quite a few cases that did seem to be out of place. I mean, what he mentioned before about outlayers, uh, uh, typical cases. Well, when we had a look at the data themselves, some of them were really weird. Uh, it's like, I mean, the dotted, the dotted line is the real case, the outlayer. Uh, the solid line is the average of its tumor type. So, I mean, as you can see in these first two, phew, I mean, not exactly uh, what you would expect. Then we went back to the radiologist and said, you told me this was good. Man, I mean, this is not, no? this looks really dodgy. What's going on? Well, it was funny because, first of all, we learned that the case, each case, had been validated by three people, three medical experts according to biopsy. Okay? And the first thing we learned, it was a voting system. So if two out of three decided this was a glioblastoma, it was a glioblastoma, even, even if the other guy said this was an astrocytoma grade two. Okay? First of all, a voting system. So no unanimity here. Second, a case was considered to be perfectly valid if enough of it was informative. So what we learned there was the way a radiologist looks at this data. It's like, okay, I know, yeah, this part is absolutely bollocks. I ignore it, okay? But the rest of it is informative enough for me so I can make an informed decision about what type of tumor it is. Of course, the machine is going to be absolutely fooled by this. Absolutely. Three or four cases like this and everything goes awry, right? But the doctors don't get fooled. I mean, they know how to separate the parts that they know are artifacts or whatever. So actually, we ended up with literally sitting with them, going through each case of apparently atypical uh, cases and writing a list of why they were atypical, okay? <clears throat> so that we might think of actually removing some of them or not, or doing something about it. I mean, this was a, a, a case, a typical case of not shared language. What was atypical for us and for the machines, what not, was not atypical for them. So, I mean, things as trivial as this, you know, can make things go completely wrong, okay? And even then, I mean, these people, although they thought this was interesting, whatever, I mean, they will never use it in practice. But that might be a matter for, <laughs> for a different uh, further discussion, maybe after lunch. So, let's leave it there. Thank you very much. There's some questions. But I like your last example. So, indeed, you need to speak different languages and <coughs> using the purely engineering data mind to look at medical data is absolutely wrong unless you understand the really workflow of clinicians and how they interpret the data. Well, I know Alfredo for many years, so I know that he's very brilliant and that he <laughs> works in the symbolic world. Uh, but I have... That, 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 <coughs> so that sounds like I work in the underworld, you know? <laughs> no, sub-symbolic. It's not underworld. Uh, so first, uh, one of the things that we have to start doing is to about talking about the ethics of AI. It's, we, we should refocus the, uh, the problem to the ethics of the use of technology. Because it's not only AI. AI now is just uh, on a hype. And everybody's talking about that because there is a folk thinking about the possibilities of using AI to make decisions over our lives. It can be used like that, but it's not really the case still. Uh, but there is the whole <coughs> technology that, that can be happening. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's of course, uh, an issue that we scientists have the capabilities never seen before we are able to integrate many of those technologies with the knowledge of other ex uh, fields of expertise like, like medicine. 
But maybe uh, as a scientist, we have to refrain ourselves and think that there are things that we shouldn't do. Yep. And what is happening is that most of these companies that are driven by a kind of capitalism are doing things that are just not permitted. The humans don't should do that. And we, as a scientist, we should forbid ourselves to doing that. And that's one of the other things. Mm -hmm. So machines won't be ethic, uh, they won't be uh, fair. And the other thing, and that's the most important thing of this, is that we have to relearn how to design experiments. So if you don't know how to design an experiment and, and curate a database, and you think that you have a uh, database is a, and a lot of epochs or any kind of computing, you will have a, a, um, a result anyhow. With a ma classification machine, you will classify in two at least. Yeah. And it will be as good, uh, or if it's useful, will be good or, or not. So that, that's one of the problems. And so we, we are including many things in, in, in the sa under the same uh, names and concepts, and one of the most striking things uh, here there is a lot of people that come in from from the field of uh, health or biology, and they may have some courses of uh, of ethics, or they are if they are clinicians, they have uh, the Hippocrates Oath or other kind of ethical commitments that they learn. But almost none of the engineer uh, part of the audience had had a an ethics course or a philosophical course, not even in the secondary schools or the high school. So why we are asking engineers to think about ethics because they don't know anything about it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm teaching ethics in, in the School of Computer Science, the Masters of Artificial Intelligence, and you start asking people, have you ever read your constitution? How many of you read your constitution? Okay. Uh, how many of you remember the commandments of your religion, whatever religion it is? How many of you have ever read uh, Descartes or yeah, whatever the Plato or Aristotle ethics books? No? OK. So let's start talking about uh, mm. ethics. And we're asking all these. And here, we are educated people. Imagine in the streets. Or imagine in the political parties. Come on. They, they, they don't care about that. So the regulator is overpassed by our capabilities. And we are creating a discourse that is very complicated, it's like chicken poles, and we need a vaccination that will be this kind of uh, things that is. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more with, with what you said. I mean, there, there is a lack of, uh, of ethical discourse in general in the technological world, and uh, only now people are beginning to be aware. I, uh, related to that, I would just want to, I mean, if, again, this is a very nice paper that if you have not read, I mean, it's really cool. Unintended consequences of machine learning in medicines published by the by the JAMA journal. Uh, really good paper. I mean, they they cite they list uh, quite a few things like reducing the skills uh, the skilling of physicians, focusing too much on text because of electronic health records and not in demising the context, so to say, not taking into account the intrinsic uncertainty of medicine, something that has been mentioned before, and you know the need to open this machine learning black box. Uh, all of those things are, you know, right now part of the debate. Okay, here's some last questions <coughs> because we tried to do a lot of the discussion this afternoon. That's a very short question. So if you are trying to analyze data, trying to, to understand the rules mm. that define what you have observed yeah. in this field, you are not trying to reinvent epidemiology? Because epidemiology is, is, is has been doing this work for decades, if not yeah. centuries. Yeah, I mean, going for instance back to the example I I, I, I gave before. I mean, we were working with radio radiologists using a very small database of MRS data, proton MRS data, and with expert labeled um, cases of all types of brain tumor. Mm. Of course, we are. I mean, at, in a problem like that, we are not trying at all. Uh, to go to the basis of redefining epidemiolo epidemiology, what we were trying to do is something completely different, is to create some sort of decision-making pipeline to help a radiologist to inform a decision about a certain diagnosis. I mean, I don't think that's pretending to reinvent epidemiolo epidemiology in, in any way. Uh, and in fact, the most interesting outcome 
was not about the classification itself in the correct. We were trying, well, I mean, if we get new cases, we can classify them, all right, and give an informed decision to the radiologist, like it or not. I mean, we realized that the, what they really appreciated was any new insight about what was what those data were the, were telling them. And actually, there is another example, oh, sorry, no, <laughs> this is not my presentation any longer. Uh, <laughs> in which we did feature selection trying to find out of the MRS which metabolites were the most responsible for, for sorry about that. Um, I have already, no, no, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. No, no, no let's forget about it. I mean, I w we realized that the, the answers the machine was providing wa were meaningless, meaningless to them because they didn't correspond to known metabolites that they knew that they have an impact on deciding between, okay, the classifier was 95% accurate was completely useless. I mean, we were not trying to <laughs> redefine epidio. Actually, we got a lesson on that. I mean, we got a lesson on saying, well, look, okay, nice results, but they don't mean anything to, uh, to us. We cannot interpret them. Off you go. Keep in mind that many of the tools that we do is just contemporary statistics. Yeah. Nothing different. Glorified. So contemporary there is no difference between epidemiology and machine learning and things like that. It's what you use for what, for which to interpret. That's the most important. So, mm. One last question or? Okay, I think then we can move on. Thank you.